Well, good morning, everybody. Lovely to see everybody this morning. And really believe the Lord has something to say to us this morning. Wonderful word through uh, the message in tongues and interpretation, just even what David said there, I think just ties in with the, the word the Lord has laid on my heart. So I really pray, I believe this is for people here this morning, certainly has ministered to me and, and reminded me uh, of the love of God and uh, just God's care for us. You know that God cares for you this morning. He doesn't just have you as one of the numbers in the book of life. He, he knows you. The, the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus is talking in the sermon, he says, just a wee step, he says, your father knoweth. He knows. This morning he knows exactly where you are. And what I want to speak to you this morning and hopefully encourage you from God's word is on just the subject of weariness. I felt the Lord give me a little verse <clears throat> from it. Just give me some more thoughts just to bring. Um, it says this in Psalm 68, verse 9. We're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 19. But just this little verse, it said, God says, You give abundant showers, O God. The psalmist says, You give abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance. And you know, we get weary. This can be a very difficult world to live in. And there can be many things that can bring us to a place of just being weary. Um, but let's just pray for a moment. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you know everything about us. We thank you that you are with us, even when we don't realize. And we think of that lovely prayer, the footprints, that, Lord, whenever we look back and only saw one set of footprints, that it was then that you were actually carrying us. So, Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you're a, a good shepherd, and a good shepherd goes after the sheep. And Lord, we just worship you this morning. We give you glory and praise for who you are and who you are to us, Lord. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will illuminate our hearts with the knowledge of Christ and the wonder of who he is and who he is to us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Are we recording, David, this morning? Or? Yes, so. Yeah. I don't know if I need my glasses or not, let's see. <clears throat> right, just a question for you, and it's a, I'm sure it's a question that every one of us can answer. Has anyone ever, here ever got weary? Yeah. Have you ever been weary? I support Liverpool. I get weary all the time. <laughs> so <too. laughs> I'm getting, getting very nervous today. There's a, bit, there's a big game on today, but uh, uh, yes, now that must be a, a terrible situation. <laughs> but there's many things in life that get us weary. Upgrades in technology really weary me. When you go on and you need an upgrade, it's doing my head, and I'm going back to a, a slate and a bit of chalk, so I am. Um, work can be wearisome. Family life can be wearisome. Um, health issues can be wearisome. My, my, even church can be wearisome sometimes. Never, I hear you say. I know that, that that's not obviously Antrim. That's other places. It's not, it's obviously not here. <clears throat> but it's a reality in the life of a believer that we get weary, as it has been throughout all ages, for, especially for the people of God, and the stark reality is that we can get weary. We can get weary with things. And we can put on a good front, can't we? How are you? I am okay, I'm okay. That's typical Northern Ireland sort of stoic sort of, ah, I'm okay, oh, stiff upper lip. But God knows where you're at. He knows. And sometimes, and we do need to be careful, we need to be open and we need to be honest with each other. And pray God brings people into your life that we can... We can do that with, but I'm encouraged today. I believe God wants to refresh us. He wants to meet with us. He wants to sustain us. And in a sense, bring us a sense of revival. We hear talk about revival, revival. Well, what is revival? Revival is not, uh, it's not lost people becoming Christians. That's more of a spiritual awakening. Revival is something that has been alive, that is near to death, being revived. And I would say that the church could do with a healthy dollop of that. All of us, I'm sure, we wouldn't say no to that. And we pray that that would extend to the nation. Out of revival, I believe, comes spiritual awakening in the land. But we're going to look at a wee man 
a lot of wee money. Uh, he had hit me a clout around the head, if you heard me say that. Uh, in the Bible called Elijah. I don't think I would mess with Elijah. <laughs> We're going to look at a, a part of his story in 1 Kings 19. And I've shared from this passage many times, but there's something very specific in here I felt the Lord led me to. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 19, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom brush tree and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the brush bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, <clears throat> for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Now, it's a familiar story uh, that I'm sure we're all aware of. And I've always been troubled with this part in the story because Elijah, as you know, has just uh, brought about a great revival, seen the rainfall, seen the prophets of Baal slain. And then this happens. And it's always puzzled me a little bit. He'd been a man who was faithfully and powerfully serving God. First of all, in standing before God, getting the word from God to bring, confronting a king and a, a queen, and obediently following God's leading to Brook Kareth and then Zarepta, in prayer and confronting a very intimidating host of wicked prophets. He was outnumbered 850 to 1. Now that would be... That would be tough, a tough ticket for anyone. And then he slew those prophets and through prayer, saw a revival break, up, break out on the land and the rain come. <clears throat> wow, super Christian, eh? He really is the man. He really is a powerful man. But you see, the scripture gives us a little bit of insight into him. And it says this in the book of James. He was a man just like us, just like you and I human being, a person of like passions, James says. And he made some mistakes. Do you know that we can make mistakes in our walk? Has anyone ever made a mistake? Yeah. Anyone here? No? Well, he made a few mistakes that really surprise us, but if this could happen to him, I'm sure it could happen to me or to you. And that's why the scripture is given to us, so that through the scriptures we can learn the lessons that these guys went through and not make the same mistake. And he did make some mistakes here because it tells us after he had killed all the prophets, Jezebel, this queen, this wicked queen, isn't it interesting that you don't get many wee daughters or granddaughters called Jezebel today. It's the same as the name Adolf, or you don't, you don't, name, you don't name your children. But this is one name that has gone down in infamy and in history, this wicked queen. And I always find it very interesting that this queen never confronted Elijah to his face. Always from behind the scenes sniping. And she does it again here. She sent a messenger. She didn't go herself. She sent the messenger. And you see, the enemy's sneaky. He's sneaky in how he works, and how he works through people. <clears throat> she sent the messenger, and a threat was contained. And I'm always surprised here. This man just seems to bottle it. He seems to listen. First of all, he listens to what is said. He doesn't seem to have any critical analysis. He doesn't seem to consider 
hang on, hang on, love. I've just killed all your prophets, 850 of them, and you're next. Now, there could have been a different outworking of this. He could have went, listen to what you said, listen to this threat, because I'll tell you what, a bad report can come to our lives at times. We can hear a bad report. We can hear the report of the enemy. I'm going to get you. I'm going to finish you off. You're dead. Your history. But whose report are we going to believe this morning? Because there's another report. And there's a report that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And on the strength of that, the writer in Hebrew says, we can confidently say that God is our helper. Why didn't Elijah just go, is that right, love? Well, I'm coming to see you today. You're not going to evade me anymore. I'm coming to look at you dead in the eye and your history. But this story doesn't play out like that. And sometimes our story doesn't play out like that. We can be hit with a bad report, a threat, a sense of imminent danger, and we can bottle it, we can run, we can fold. I know I've done it too many times. And Elijah ran. It says he ran. And he ran away basically from his assignment. He'd been called to do something. And, and some people could say, oh, it's terrible irresponsibility. He was heading up a great revival and then he just runs out of, the, out of the place. What a failure, some people could say. What an error, what a mistake. He needs his P45. We need to give him his P45, send him on his way. He's no use. He's failed. Get him out of the ministry. Get him away. He's never getting back in a pulpit again. Run him out of town. How can he minister again? Sure, he made a big mistake. He needs brought before the committee and sorted out. I can hear the voices giving them a hard time. Maybe I've given them a hard time when I read it and went, what did you do that for, Elijah? But you know, I don't think he was a failure. I think he was weary. I think this attack caught him in a bad moment and he was ready to fold. He had just given and given and given and sometimes when we're giving and giving in ministry or life or family, we need to be wise and we maybe need to take ourselves apart and rest because this can happen and I think this is one of the lessons I know I've learned from this story that if I'm not careful, the enemy can take me unaware and I'll not be thinking straight and I'll not be rested. And the scripture tells us that Jesus, on many occasions, even when there was crowds pressing in, took himself because he knew he needed to be with his father. And the life of Jesus is one of going from one place of prayer with his father to the next place of prayer and in between there were miracles. And that's what we need to learn from. But you see, the Lord knows that he's weary. And God is aware of this. And God, thankfully, has a way of dealing with our weariness. But sometimes I think evades committees and groups and our peers, our family, our people. And I'm so glad that we have a God who knows our frame. He knows that we're dust. He knows that we're just a breath that passes by. And in days gone by, and I wasn't sure, I'm going to share this here. I've been subject now, I think this is tragically sad. And I'm only, the purpose of me saying is this, is that we learn from this, that, the, that we're not the people who do this. That I don't do this because I know what's in me. The sinful human nature is something we wrestle with and can trip us up. And I've been subject in time, in years gone by, places that you'll not know, <clears throat> and I'm not going to mention but I've been subject, even in church, to quite harsh judgment that is devoid of the grace of God. Seriously. That happens in religious circles. It happened to Christ. And if it happened to him, it can happen to us. And we need to be very careful. But I am thankful that God himself is not like that. You see, sometimes life can be brutal. It can be brutal in the way it deals with people. Sometimes church can be difficult as well. It's not perfect. It's filled with imperfect people. And we really need the grace to deal with that as well and to forgive. Particularly in ministry, you see, people in ministry are more accountable. That's, the scripture tells us that particularly those who teach, 
But they also need a lot of grace. They really do, because people in ministry are on the front line. And the enemy's out to get them as well as he's out to get every child of God. <clears throat> and Elijah was on the front line of this battle. And he came face to face with his old enemy again, this wicked entity, Jezebel, who could never face him. I always think that's amazing. The enemy is a coward. It's, it's easy to accuse people. It's easy to attack people. But the scripture says, and the Lord tells us, if you have an issue with someone, go to them. Don't in the background. Go to them and speak to them. And the heart has to be that you get it sorted out. Now, the scripture never ever says that you'll not be annoyed with someone, that people won't do anything. It tells us that there will be issues, but it also gives us very clear guidance on how to deal with those issues. And I am I'm going to bang on about this again. I am convinced the reason we do not have revival in our land, in our churches, is because People are sitting in churches with issues against each other. Mm -hmm. And you see, if you try to bring your offering to God and you're singing away and you think you're like an angel, oh, see if you've got something in your heart against your brother. I want to ask you, is that offering acceptable to God? You could sing like the choir. But see, the offering God wants us to go over and shake your brother's hand and say, I'm sorry. That's acceptable and pleasing to God. And I think rather than tearing down the, the local principality from the mountain before we have revival, I'm asking the question, how did he get there? Whenever the church allows the enemy to work in us and, and through sin in the church, that's how the enemy gets any foothold. And we need to remove it. We need to remove it. And then I believe we'll see God work. <clears throat> See, Elijah could have reacted very differently, less that I've said, but he didn't. It says Elijah fled. He ran away. And he arrived at a terrible place in his life. He wanted to die. How could that easy Christian? How could that happen? It can happen. It can happen. It happened to Elijah. And he was under it so much. He was under depression, oppression. He felt like a failure. We get a bit of an insight from what he said about himself, even his opinion on himself. I'm no better than my father's. No one ever said he was better than his father's. But that's what he thought about himself. He actually thought he was a failure. He thought that he had failed God. He was part of one of the greatest moves in the scripture where the fire from heaven fell, burnt up the sacrifice, and not only exposed Baal as a false god, but wiped clean the slate of the wicked, wicked uh, clergy that were in the land and cleaned the decks for God to work and move in the nation once again. But you see, he ran away and he lay down. And you see, it's easy to do that. We all can do that. I can do that. And we need to we need to take care. And we need to take care of each other. We need to look out for each other. We need to think about each other. A word of encouragement can make so much difference to someone. You see, one of the things that he did as well, it says that he separated himself. Let me just get that again. He separated himself from his servant. It says, Elijah was afraid and ran from his life. When he came to Beersheba in Jerusalem, he left his servant there. Now that's important because what he did was he separated himself from strengthening relationships. And it's easy to do that. You just want to get, I need to get away from people. I need to, but be careful. Don't separate yourself from church. Don't separate yourself from those relationships that can help. Not every relationship necessarily will help, but there are ones that and do not separate whenever you get into that place because that's a tactic of the enemy. to get you off on your own. And don't do that. <clears throat> so our weary hero Elijah has done a runner. And he's fleeing away, not only from his calling as his task. And we could give him a hard time about this. You're let, oh, you're letting God down. Have you ever heard that one? Has anyone ever said that to you? Oh, you're letting the Lord down. Listen, God never had any illusions about us. 
So we're not letting him down. He knows us. He knows exactly what we're like and he loves us. <clears throat> Some people can really let on thick. I know I've had it, great lashings of shame and guilt and condemnation that people want you to marinate in these things. But God doesn't want you to. God loves you and he doesn't do this with Elijah and it's lovely because the Lord recognizes when you and I get weary and grow weary because the Bible says we're on a pilgrimage through this world. This is not our home. This is a pilgrimage we're walking through and there's mountain tops in this life. But most of the time I think we're trundling through the valley. But the scripture says, even though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, there you are with me. He knows our frame, he knows that we're just dust. And you know something that's very encouraging about this? See, whenever we don't even have the strength, because Elijah didn't here, he just wanted to die. There was no, oh, get to the prayer meeting, Elijah. Oh, you need to, you need to get out to the Bible study. You need to, he didn't have the energy to do that. And you know what the Lord does Whenever maybe we can't come to the altar, he comes to us. And the Lord comes to Elijah, he sends his angel. And what does the Lord say to his weary servant? Does he chide him, rebuke him, tell him off, remind him of his great responsibilities? You need to go back, Elijah, you need to get back. No, he doesn't. We see the Lord here deal with this situation in a way that I believe every one of us here could learn from. The Lord's gracious and he's kind and he's gentle and he's good. The Lord sends his angel. You see, the angels are those who are sent as ministering spirits to those who are the heirs of salvation. And the Lord sends his angel and the angel touches him. Tells him to arise and eat. Twice he does it. And it goes on to talk about the angel of the Lord. We could zoom from teaching, but not time to go into it. Is this Christ himself that comes to him? You see, the good shepherd goes after the sheep. The good shepherd will go after the stray, go after the one whose leg is broken. He doesn't just leave them. Ach, they've got off the bus. I'm driving the bus and they're away. I'm driving on. Nope. The good shepherd goes after his sheep. Because this great man is in a bad way. He suffered a serious spiritual attack. And that's what it was. It was a spiritual attack. And you know that each one of us here can be accept, uh, susceptible to an attack from the enemy. And you see, the attack usually comes. <clears throat> Sometimes we can think, oh God, you know, I've done something wrong, you know. Sometimes the attack comes because you've done something right and the enemy's a wee bit annoyed about it. You see, whenever the seven sons of Sceva were trying to cast out a demon out of a man, the demon said, Christ I know and I know of Paul, but who are you? Who are you? And it says he gave them such a beating they all fled away with their clothes all ripped off. See, the, the enemy knows who you are. And sometimes the attack of the enemy is allowed. It's allowed because Satan knows that you're affecting his kingdom. So it's not always a bad sign. Sometimes in a strange way, it can be a good sign that you're being effective for the king. And Elijah had been very effective here. And he came under this spiritual attack. <clears throat> We could speculate today that Elijah, I thought he should have done this, if he'd done this, if he'd done that. But there's no indicators here that Elijah was taking himself to the side. It just seems that Elijah was just plowing on with what he did. And maybe we could speculate he was maybe a bit unwise. Maybe he should have taken that time apart. Because I believe, I'm a great believer that prevention is better than cure. And sometimes, whenever we're getting tired, whenever we're getting weary... It's maybe we sign this that we need to stop and we need to just get back into God's presence again. Just get back in again. You see, life can throw us many curves as we trundle along its path, even as we're walking with God. And sometimes those curves can even seem insurmountable. For Elijah, it seemed to cloud his whole vision. 
He couldn't see. He just couldn't see ahead. He just wanted to die. I'm useless, Lord. I failed. I just want to die. And that's sometimes how an attack of the enemy can affect us. We just lose complete perspective of things. The mountains look impossible. They look too big to deal with because if our focus goes on to these things alone and nothing else, then all we're going to see is the problem right in front. And it's easy to do. It's too easy to do, in fact. But you see, if we're walking along this path of life, even if it's in the valley, your hand and my hand is firmly in his hand, in the hand of the man who died for you, the one who died on Calvary, the one who came and gave his life so that you could have life and have a hope and a future. If your hand is in his hand this morning, then I can tell you you'll see things very differently. If you're walking along the path of ministry, looking for the lead and direction from the man who died for you, if you're walking along that path of sickness, close in the presence of the one who holds your eternal whereabouts in his hand, then those issues and problems and attack take a different colour and hue and shape because we see them beneath the shadow of the eternal God who is your refuge today. Read of the story, that giant King David, when he was a young shepherd boy, because he was a giant and he took on a spiritual pygmy called Goliath. And he got it right because he knew what it was to dwell in the presence of God. And I love the story because it says this here. Elijah or Goliath had been coming out doing his, uh, uh, the Greek actually word I think says slobber. But anyway, no, that's, maybe, that's, maybe that's Ulster Scots, I don't know. <laughs> but Goliath was coming out intimidating everybody. Every morning, 40 days. And all the people could do was cower under this. Do you know why? Because they didn't see God. They didn't see who God was. And young David comes along, a man, who, a boy who had been dwelling in the presence of God on those hills of Judea. And he said, this boy is dishonouring my God. His perspective was completely different. He didn't see a giant. He saw the awesomeness of God. And it says this, that he ran at him. Did anyone ever see the film Troy? With uh, Brad Pitt. I, lo I love the story. But it always makes me think about David. Because he arrives at the army and he's got to fight this huge um, Thracian Warrior, the champion of the Thracians, to stop all the armies. It's going to be a combat just between champions. And he has a casual conversation with the king Agamemnon. And then he doesn't even, he doesn't stand and go, oh, look how big he is. He's so confident in his own ability. But I think about David. David wasn't confident in his own ability. He was confident in his God. And Achilles just runs and the guy throws a spear and he ducks it and he just runs up. Before the guy has his sword out, Achilles has him killed. And I always think about that with Goliath. David ran at him. How could you run at a problem like Goliath? Because whenever your sight sees a bigger God than Goliath ever could be, a bigger answer and solution, that's how you can do it. Some had a perspective of Goliath was too big to kill. But David saw Goliath was too big to miss. And he slew that mountain that was in front of him because he knew who was with him. He knew that God was going to give him into his hands. And that only happens, that, that perspective, there's only one place you can get that. You can't get it in the faith mission. In all those books. There's only one place and that's in God's presence. And that's the place, and you know that I'm always calling you back into that secret place with him. Not even just church meetings or Bible studies, as wonderful they are, or fellowship. The most important place you and I can be is with him.
So Elijah had lost sight. He'd lost his vision. And the Bible says in, in the, the book of Proverbs, where there's no vision, the people perish. When you lose sight of God, it's easy to cast off restraint and just to, to give up. And that's what Elijah had done. And the essential thing was for him to get back into the presence of God. Gives God the Lord gives him the ability. He gives him food. He doesn't chide him. He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't even say, oh, no, Elijah, maybe you should have. Maybe you should have. You know, you know the way people can give you good advice sometimes? You know those people who come along? They're lovely, aren't they? They come along and they, they just have the answer. I've got the answer for you. Well, they're great and there's a place for that. But sometimes you just want someone to come along and the scripture talks about weep with those who weep. Mourn with those who mourn. And the Lord doesn't say anything. He doesn't rebuke him. He lets, he lets him say his thing. And then he decides to feed him. He decides to be very practical. And he gives him something to eat and drink to refresh him and sustain him. And I'll tell you what, I'm a baker by trade. I would love to get that recipe. 40 days that kept them going. Those two cakes now. If I could be, I'd be putting over out of business. So I would. <clears throat> And he gives them the ability, he gives them the strength, because Elijah didn't have the strength. And see, whenever we're in a place where we're depleted, get before God and let him put that strength and that vision and, that, and vision and that perspective back into you again. And you see, he heads off somewhere. He doesn't go back to the revival. He doesn't go back to what's happening. He knows that he needs to get before God and he, he makes his way to the mountain of the Lord. You see, life can gang up on you. People, friends, work colleagues, workplaces, health issues, ministry issues, difficulties. Do you know what they can do? They can come up and mug you. They can come up and take you by surprise and knock you off your feet. Even whenever you're trying to be diligent, this can still happen. But what we need to do is not run away. We need in those times to run to God when there's nowhere else to go because he'll help you. And even whenever you're running away from him, he'll come after you because he loves you this morning. He wants to strengthen you this morning. He wants to encourage you. He wants to let you know this morning that everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. Do you know something? This world, as I've said, is not our home. We don't belong here anymore. We're only pilgrims passing through. This, just to inform you in case you read the book, this isn't your best life now. I really hope this isn't my best life now. But it's not. Because there's a city whose builder and maker is God that we're going to. And we need to keep that in the forefront of our thinking. This morning he knows where you are. And as a preacher of God's word, I want to tell you that he cares where you are. And he wants to meet with you. He wants to refresh you. He wants to bring you back into that place of peace and rest. He's the only one that can make what seems like a desert place flow with rivers and flourish again. So if you feel as if you're in a desert place this morning, if you feel that you're in a place where What's just happened? Everything's gone belly up. God can turn that around. God can make the desert flow and blossom like the Garden of Eden. And that applies to our lives. Sometimes we can have areas in our life that seem to be barren and just weary and tired. But he can change it. He can change it. I'm going to finish with just some words from an invitation the Lord gives to us, gives to us all that's found in the Gospel of Matthew. I'm just going to read them out and then I'm going to pray and I'm finished. Because this is all you need to hear. If you've heard nothing of what I've said, listen to these words from our dear Lord. Matthew 11, and you know them well, but it's good to... Verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord, we just thank you this morning that we serve a God who cares for us. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who died that we might have life. We thank you that you hold us in the palm of your hand and no one can snatch us from you. I just pray that you will be with your people this morning. I pray that you will make them aware of your presence that never leaves them and never forsakes them. I just pray that you would be so real and so tangible. I pray that you would speak those words that each individual needs to hear from you this morning. We love you, Lord, and we just commit this message and time into your dear hands, Lord. In Jesus' name. Yeah. 
have been faithful All my life you have been so, so 